Hello Year 4s, we are going to do chapter 5 and 6 today. So we ended with the lion living with Bertie in Africa in his farmhouse, sleeping at the end of his bed. So let's see what's going to happen next. Chapter 5, Running Free. It was the best year of Bertie's young life, but when it ended, it ended more painfully than he would ever have imagined. He'd always known that one day when he was older, he would have to go away to school he thought and hoped it would not be for a long time yet. He'd simply put it out of his mind. His father had just returned home from Johannesburg after his yearly business trip. He broke the news at supper that first evening. Bertie knew there was something in the wind. His mother had been sad again in recent days. Not sick, just strangely sad. She wouldn't look him in the eye and she winced whenever she tried to smile at him. The lion had just lay down beside him his head warm on Bertie's feet, when his father cleared his throat and began. It was going to be a lecture. Bertie had had them before, often enough, about manners, about being truthful, about the dangers of leaving the compound. You'll soon be eight, Bertie, he said, and your mother and I have been doing some thinking. A boy needs a proper education, a good school. Well, we found just the right place for you, a school near Salisbury in England. Your Uncle George and Aunt Melanie live nearby and have promised to look after you in the holidays and to visit you from time to time. They'll be father and mother to you for a while. You'll get on with them well enough, I'm sure you will. They are fine people, good people. So you'll be off on the ship to England in July. Your mother will accompany you. She will spend the summer with you in Salisbury and after she has taken you to your school in September, she'll then return here to the farm. It's all arranged. As his heart filled with a terrible dread, all Bertie could think of was his white lion. But the lion, he cried out, what about the lion? I'm afraid there's something else I have to tell you, father went on. Looking across at Bertie's mother, he took a deep breath and then he told him. He told him that he had met a man whilst he was in Johannesburg, a French man, a circus owner from France. He was over in Africa looking for lions and elephants to buy for his circus. He liked them young, <coughs> very young, a year or less, so he could train them up without too much trouble. Besides, they were easier and cheaper to transport when they were young. He would be coming out to the farm in a few days' time to see the white lion for himself. If he liked what he saw, he would pay good money and take him away. It was the only time in his life that Bertie had ever shouted at his father, No! No, you can't! It was rage that wrung the hot tears from him. They soon gave way to silent tears of sadness and loss. There was no comfort in him, but his mother tried all the same. <coughs> we can't keep him here forever, Bertie. You've always known that. And you've seen how he stands by the fence, gazing out into the felt. You've seen him pacing up and down. But we can't just let him out. He'd be all on his own, no mother to protect him. He couldn't cope. He'd be dead in weeks. You know he would. But you can't send him to a circus. You can't, said Bertie. He'll be shut up behind bars. I promised him that he never would be. And they'll point at him. They'll laugh at him. He'd rather die. Any animal would. But he knew as he looked across the table at them that it was hopeless. Their minds were quite made up. For Bertie, the betrayal was total. That night he made up his mind that what, what was to be done. He waited until he heard his father's deep breathing next door. Then with his white lion at his heels, he crept downstairs in his pyjamas, took down his father's rifle from the rack and stepped out into the night. The compound gate yawned open noisily when he pushed it. But then they were out, out and running free. Bertie had no thoughts of the dangers around him, only that he must get as far from home as he could before he did it. <coughs> the lion padded along beside him, stopping every now and again to sniff the air. A clump of trees became a herd of elephants wandering towards them out of the dawn. Bertie ran for it. He knew how elephants hated lions. He ran and ran till his legs could run no more. As the sun came up over the felt, he climbed to the top of the copy and sat down, his arms round the lion's neck. Time had come. Be wild now, he whispered. You've got to be wild. Don't come home. Don't ever come home. They'll put you behind bars. You hear what I'm saying? All my life I'll think of you. I promise I will. I won't ever forget you. 
and he buried his head in the lion's neck and heard the greeting groan from deep inside him. He stood up. I'm going now, he said. Don't follow me. Please don't follow me. And Bertie clambered down off the copy and walked away. When he looked back, the lion was still sitting there watching him. But then he stood up, yawned, stretched, licked his lips and sprang down after him. Bertie shouted at him, but he kept coming. He threw sticks, he threw stones, nothing worked. The lion would stop, but then as soon as Bertie walked on, he simply followed at a safe distance. <coughs> Go back, Bertie yelled. You stupid, stupid lion, I hate you, I hate you. Go back. But the lion kept loping after him, whatever he did, whatever he said. There's only one thing for it now. He didn't want to do it, but he had to. With tears filling his eyes and his mouth, he lifted the rifle to his shoulder and fired over the lion's head. At once the lion turned tail and scampered away through into the felt. Bertie fired again. He watched he could see him no more and then turned for home. He knew he'd have to face what was coming to him. Maybe his father would strap him. Thre he threatened it often enough. But Bertie didn't mind. His lion would have his chance for freedom. Maybe not much of one. Anything was better than the bars and the whips of the circus. So should we go on to the next chapter to find out what happens with the lion? Does he stay in the wild? Chapter 6. The Frenchman. They were waiting on the veranda, his mother in her nightgown, his father in his hat, his horse saddled, ready to come after him. I've set him free, Bertie cried. I've set him free so he won't ever have to live behind bars. He was sent to his room at once, where he threw himself onto his bed and buried his face in his pillow. Day after day, his father went out looking for the white lion, but each evening he came back empty-handed and blazing with fury. What will I tell the Frenchman when he comes, eh? Did you for one minute think of that, Bertie? Did you? I should strap you. Any father worth his salt would strap you. But he didn't. Bertie spent all day and every day at the fence, or up his tree in the compound, or at his bedroom window, his eyes scanning the felt for anything white moving through the grass. He prayed at his bedside every night until his knees were numb, prayed that his white lion would learn how to kill, would somehow find enough to eat, would avoid the hyenas, the other lions too come to that. Above all, he prayed that he would not come back, at least not until the Frenchman from the circus had come and gone. The day the Frenchman came, it rained, the first rain for months, it seemed. Bertie watched him as he stood there, dripping on the veranda, his thumb hooked into his waistcoat pocket, as Bertie's father broke the news that there's no white line to collect, that he had escaped. That was the moment when Bertie's mother put her hand to her throat, cried out and pointed. The white lion was wandering through the open compound gate, yowling pitifully. Bertie ran to him and fell on his knees and held him. The lion was soaked to the skin and trembling. He was panting with hunger and so thin you could see his rib cage. They all helped to rub him down and they looked on as he ate ravenously. <coughs> Magnifique, cried the Frenchman, and white, just as you said, white like the snow and tame too. He will be the star of my circus. I shall call him Le Prince Blanc, the White Prince. He will have all he needs, all he wants, fresh meat every day, fresh straw every night. I love my animals, you know. They are my family. And this line of yours, he will be my favourite son. Have no fear, young man. I promise you, he will never be hungry again. He put his hand on his heart. As God is my witness, I promise it. Bertie looked up into the Frenchman's face. It was a kind face, not smiling, yet earnest and trustworthy. But even so, it did not make Bertie feel any better. There, you see, said Bertie's mother. <coughs> He'll be happy. And that's all that matters, Bertie, isn't it? Bertie knew there's no point in begging. He knew now that the lion would never survive on his own in the wild, that he would have to go with the Frenchman. There was nothing else for it. That night, as he lay in the dark together, side by side, Bertie made the lion a last promise. I will find you, he whispered. Always remember that I'll find you. I promise I will. The next morning, the Frenchman shook hands with Bertie on the veranda and said goodbye. 
He'll be fine, don't you worry. <coughs> and one day you must come to France and see my circus, Le Cirque Melo. It's the best circus in all of France. Then they left the white line in a wooden crate rocking from side to side in the back of the Frenchman's wagon. Bertie watched until the wagon disappeared from view. <coughs> a few months later, Bertie found himself on a ship steaming out of Cape Town bound for England and a school and a new life. As the last of Table Mountain vanished in a heat haze, he said goodbye to Africa and was not at all unhappy. He had his mother with him and for the for the time being at least, and after all, England was nearer France than Africa was, much nearer. So that brings us to the end of that chapter. I wonder what will happen with Bertie and his lion. I'll see you tomorrow.